Welcome, everyone, to the Movement Made Better podcast. Today, we have Giovanni Rosselli. We've been looking forward to having him on. Giovanni, we'll let you go ahead and uh, give the l- listeners a little background on yourself. Great. And, you know, obviously, thank you both for, for having me. And, you know, before I tell anybody about me, I wanted to say that I have much appreciation and respect for the two of you, what you've been able to do with Stick Mobility, what you're doing with the podcast. I told you guys offline. I listen to the podcast every week. So it's kind of weird now. I guess I don't have to listen to this one because, <laughs> because, because I'm on it, but much, much respect and appreciation for, for stick mobility. I love using your product. I love everything you guys are putting out there in, in an industry where there's infinite amount of tools that are being thrust upon us as the best or the coolest or the newest. You guys have, have made your mark. And, you know, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that because it, it is something to be to be very proud of. And the two of you should be very proud of that. Well, thank you. So thank you very appreciate much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. So a little bit about me for for those of you who don't don't know. I started my kind of health and fitness career as a as a former WWE professional wrestler. And, you know, kind of my story even before that was wasn't the most athletic kid, wasn't the most jacked in my in my high school by any means. And I was told that I wouldn't do it when I told people I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And I got laughed at and my high school baseball coach actually told me that I would never be able to do it. And he discouraged me. And, you know, that, you know, part of my story, that's what got me into working out. That's what got me into fitness. That's what got me really into making my body, my, my machine, uh, so to speak. A lot of uh, trials and tribulations along the way, but I ended up earning, you know, a WWE contract, which is still one of the greatest moments of my life. And I'll kind of get into the trials and tribulations along the way. Because of the injuries that I suffered, I ended up not being able to be a full-time pro wrestler anymore. And I was doing part-time tours of Europe, wrestling tours. In between the tours, I needed a place to work out while I was still in town. I had a guest pass to this place called Equinox. Maybe you guys have heard of it. (laughs) Uh, And I had a guest pass. And then I'm working out there for about a week. And a manager comes over to me and goes, hey, you want a job here? I'm like, (laughs) yeah, sure. How hard can it be, right? Hey, do some crunches, <laughs> do some sit-ups, you know, let's, let's put a bar on your back and squat. You know, how hard could it be? It's a little part-time gig, you know, in between wrestling tours. And, you know, little did I know that that one question would literally change the entire course of, of my life. And uh, I still think about that, that man that came up to me. I still keep in touch with him. And that was about 14 years ago coming up this year. And then I jumped down the Equinox rabbit hole and I worked my way up to being a tier four coach there. It's now called TRX, which is, you know, their highest level of, of training. And I ended up being an EFTI master instructor for them. So I taught a lot of their curriculum, which were, was uh, first exposed to Michelle Dowcourt, Viper Pro Institute of Motion. And then after that, I ended up getting a great opportunity to work with Nike for several years as a content creator and consultant for them, thanks to a great contact I had through Equinox called Gerilyn Coopersmith. So if you're looking for a future guest, if you don't know who Gerilyn is, I highly recommend you looking into, in, into getting Ger- Gerilyn on here. Okay. And, you know, I, I do a lot of writing for PT on the net, newspapers, magazines, things of that sort. I do a lot of charity work for Wounded Warrior Project. I work with uh, some universities, one down here where I am, Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton. Okay. And I do presentations for them. I do guest lectures. I do guest certifications. And I also do some work with my alma mater, Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. And I do their mentorship program. And I do, you know, panelists uh, when they ask me to be a panelist on some of their forums and things like that. And last but uh, not least, because usually when people Google me, they usually find out that I've had done some acting in the past. Uh, yes, yes. And I've and I've been on some some TV shows and I've been on like HBO and Showtime. And I've had small parts on like Gotham. And I was in a couple movies. I was on The Deuce recently with James Franco. So I've had my hands in a lot of things. I, I'm, I guess I'm the act, the definition of jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Well, I, I've been a wrestling fan ever since I think I was like 11 years old. So I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So I used to watch, I would get the Canadian broadcast, the WWF that uh, most American viewers couldn't get. So I grew up watching wrestling. I still peek in on it every once in a while just to see what it's all about. But you talked about some of the trials and tribulations of, of that industry. Would you like to expound on some of some of the stories or what you experienced? Yeah. 
So I started uh, my pro wrestling journey in college. I found a local pro wrestling school, which usually people stop me right there and be like, there's pro wrestling schools. You'd be mm -hmm. surprised how many pro wrestling schools there are all around the country. You know, there's not a big, you know, big sign on it, like a life, <laughs> lifetime fitness equinox <laughs> pro wrestling school. Um, but there's a lot of uh, pro wrestling schools around, which for me, it felt kind of cool as a college kid because I was like, college kid by day, pro wrestling, aspiring <laughs> student by, by night. And you work your way up and you pay your dues. And we hear that a lot about paying your dues. But I, I think all of this experience in wrestling has helped me know and learn what it really is to pay your dues, which is things like driving 10 to 15 hours in a car with two to three guys that you may not even know to wrestle in front of 40 people, maybe, to get paid 20 bucks and to wrestle maybe six minutes. So, so do, oh. do the math on that, right? Six minute match, 20 bucks, 10 hour car ride one way. So that's about like literally one, one day in the car just to get the experience, just to get your name out there, just to maybe meet the next promoter that can book you just to wrestle someone halfway decent that can lead you to a good match to make you better for the mm -hmm. next match. And then you just do that over and over and over again, where, you know, a three hour drive was nothing. And, and now, you know, even now driving for me is like, Oh, I only have to drive two hours to go some, to go to Disney. That's, that's no problem. That, that, that's nothing. Unfortunately, that's when I also started to suffer my first, my first injury, which was a dislocated shoulder. And I end up dislocating my shoulder five times. I've had, Ooh. I've had two major shoulder operations, two major labral repairs in addition to. And this is just along the way, in addition to two partially torn pecs, neither of them were repaired. I have a partially torn bicep in the shoulder that was dislocated just because that bicep tendon was cranky and, and pissed off the whole time. And hey, I'm young. I'm in my 20s. Hey, I'm good. I'm resilient. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. But it, still feeling it now. I tore my ACL, MCL, PCL in my right knee, had major ACL reconstructive surgery patella tendon graft. I broke my right foot, has, has a screw in there now. I tore my uh, left bicep tendon, was repaired. And about now, 16, 17 years ago, when I was going to wrestling school in Louisville, Kentucky, of all places, and it's not Louisville, they pronounce it Louisville for, Louisville, for, all, yes. for all my locals there. <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> my, I had a, a tremendous amount of low back pain and I'm still in my early 20s. So, hey, no big deal. I, I went to the doctor and he said, this part I remember, he said, if you keep wrestling in about 10 years, you're going to need a major back operation. And that was about 16, 17 years ago. So I'm <laughs> kind of holding on an extra six or seven years. And hopefully with what I've learned, you know, along the way with all these great mentors that I've been able to learn from that maybe I can hold on and knock on wood, you know, maybe not even uh, yeah. need one. Those are the injuries that I've, that I've suffered, you know, along the way where I was literally averaging a surgery about every four, four years or so. <laughs> I, I, I was going, I was going under the knife. And so, you know, the, the injuries was a big part of it. And, you know, that's, you know, all kidding aside, you know, that that's when we hear, Oh, I thought wrestling was all fake anyway. And you guys don't hit each other. And you guys, you know, the, the athleticism, especially now, even before, you know, I, I was wrestling full time, you know, over 10 years ago and the way the industry has evolved now with the athleticism and the flips and the dives and the falls and everything like that, it, it's, it takes a tremendous toll on your body, which ironically enough, now, you know, I work for Institute of Motion and Michelle Dalcourt and his, one of his things is being resilient, right? And, right. you know, if, if I only train to be a little more resilient, you know, at that point, maybe I wouldn't have torn that tendon or ripped that ligament or broken that bone. The, the chances, uh, you know, of a seven, seven foot, 500 pound man taking you over their head and dropping you on your head. There's still a good chance you're going to feel that and you may, you may hurt something, but that, that's the, um, you know, that was the risk I was willing to take. I'm still very happy. I did it. I, I got my own trading card. I got my own action figure. You know, those are all cool things as a kid. Like I used to love collect trading cards and now mm -hmm. I have my own trading card. Like, like how I used to play with action figures. Now I literally am an action figure, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, and that's something that I'm very proud of, especially since, 
you know, my whole life, I was told that I wasn't big enough, strong enough, fast enough, cool enough, and you know, anything enough to to make it anywhere in wrestling. So when I'm on, when I was on those ten hour drives, and when I was coming out of anesthesia from that shoulder surgery, that was the stuff that I would think about, and that would get me through. And I would use that now in the fitness industry to say, well, pay your dues, right? You're you're not going to be the best trainer day one, right? Learn learn from those you can learn from. Ask a lot of questions. There's never a stupid question. Take a lot of certifications, pick a lot of different people's brains. And, you know, all those lessons that I learned from wrestling, I apply to fitness, which is one of the reasons why I, I feel like I've been able to be successful, you know, in the fitness industry. Well, there's a lot of teamwork that has to be done in the ring. I, I think people that watch it, and even as a kid, I, I kind of understood that, that yeah, you still fall, you still hurt. I mean, it's not, you have to learn how to fall, but the teamwork between the wrestlers inside the ring, it has to be there also, because I believe you can get a bad or a person that you really is not going to lead you correctly or help you fall correctly type of thing, right? Yeah. They often refer to it as a dance. You have a dance partner mm -hmm. and we have to ha make a good dance and we can make a really bad dance if one of us is off or one of us steps the wrong way or one of us is off the count, which is why, and give you a little, give you a little insight is usually there's always one person who leads, right? Like in a dance, someone leads in a wrestling match. Someone leads. Generally speaking, it's the heel. The heel is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. The bad guy, the heel controls the match and he's the oh. one and he's the one who kind of leads the match and he's the one. You know, there's there's a certain cutoff, you know, where the where the bad guy ends up beating the good guy, and then that's when you hope the people start to come, come on, get up, get up, you know, and then and then the bad guy goes, all right, you know, now it's time, now now it's time for get the people up, hit me a couple times, you know, so the the heel kind of leads the leads the match through. Not not always the case. Once you get to a WWE type level, everyone is phenomenal, so anybody could lead, and a lot of the really great wrestlers are able to call it in the ring. Where they literally, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of people think that oh, it's all choreographed and you do every little thing. There's really good wrestlers, and there have been plenty of them over the course of time that literally, okay, me and you, Dennis, we're going to go out there. All right, uh, we got ten minutes. All right, I'll see you out there. Here's the fi I'm uh, I'm going to throw you off the top rope as the finish, and that's it. And then the rest is is on the fly, um, wow. which is which is really amazing. How and you can't even tell. Yeah. Uh, on TV, thanks to really good camera angles and cut, you know, then, you know, if I'm going to take you into the ropes and I'm going to say, so I'm going to whisper something to you, then the camera cuts before you're able to see my mouth move. So it's like little magic tricks like that. And then the referee, it, the referee's part of the dance too. The referee's involved. The referee has an earpiece, especially for TV or pay per view. The referee is telling you guys, we're going to go commercial in 30 seconds. So then they have their kind of 30 second spot where it's okay, we're going to do a big high spot. So then we're both down. And then the announcers say, Oh, what's going to happen next? Make sure you stay tuned. Come back next. Oh, interesting. You know, so, so then, so then we're all, they're communicating, they're communicating in the truck to the referee. The referee's communicating the wrestler. The wrestlers have to put that spot together. Then everybody goes down or, you know, one person goes down and then the bad guy stands up. Oh, look at that. We'll be right back, folks. Don't go away. You know, and then you, you, and then everyone's part of the dance. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. The, uh, well, you said that the day, well, you're getting your contract with the WWE was one of your highlights. Mm -hmm. I mean, that had to be an amazing rush. It, it was still one of the top moments of my life because, uh, you know, of all the, all the sacrifice, all the drives, all the people that told me I couldn't do it. And, you know, part of that was, was moving to Louisville. Kentucky, which is where at the time the WWE minor league camp was. And I knew that if I wanted to be in the WWE and be a WWE wrestler, that I would need to go through their developmental system. So I moved down there without a contract, which for the most part, everyone down there had a contract. Um, but mm. there's a, a select few of us that said, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I don't have a contract, but man, I'm going to earn a freaking contract. I'm going to bust my butt and I'm going to work really hard. And that's, and that's what I ended up doing. So I moved to Louisville, Kentucky. I got a job as a waiter. I made around $150 a week. That's all I needed to live on and survive. I needed about $100 for food and $50 for rent per week. Yeah. And you know, I would go to the beginner class. I would go to the intermediate class and then I would watch the advanced class. So there's three different classes. I was obviously a beginner and then I worked my way up into intermediate, but I would still attend all the classes. I would look, I would watch. 
there were different teachers involved. I would look at the different teachers. I look at different styles. Just like we're looking at different pieces of fitness equipment. Oh, how can I use that piece of fitness equipment? Oh, I liked what he did with that piece of fitness equipment. I liked how he did that wrestling hold. You know, so once again, I'm kind of tying all this into what I would what I would do later. And then after moving to Louisville, earning, you know, earning the contract, you know, walking, walking up into the office and then saying, Congratulations, you know, you're you're now signed to a WE contract is, you know, I call my mom and I still get probably emotional even now, you know, just the greatest one of the greatest moments in anyone's life is when you can say, I did it. Those, mm-hmm. those three words, right? Like I, yep. I did it, right? Despite everything without, through all the obstacles, you know, still thinking of my high school baseball coach, you know, thinking I wasn't big enough. I wasn't strong. I'm barely six foot tall. These guys are six foot seven, 300 pounds, you know, through all that, the shoulder surgeries, the dislocations. Do you think I got discouraged when I kept getting injured and, uh, and all my family was so worried and saying, oh, come, come on, can you stop the wrestling now? You keep getting hurt. You keep having surgery. You know, it's, it's very dangerous. I don't want to see my son or my cousin or my brother, you know, go through another injury or go through another surgery. But I said, no, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to finish this un- until I finish it. So all that together, all that emotion, you know, it's the journey. Right. It was, it, mm-hmm. it was the journey to it. And if I didn't have that journey, then the, the destination wouldn't have been that sweet. Right. If, if I, yeah. if I just, if I was six, five and jacked and I, I got a contract a year in and, you know, I didn't have to have any, you know, injuries or anything like that, it, it wouldn't have been nearly, nearly as sweet. And the fact that I'm still able to take the lessons that I've learned from that and apply it to different careers, you know, is something that, you know, I feel like I've gotten a lot of, you know, longevity out of. Well, I tend to think that. People that have gone through experiences like you have versus people that are have those natural qualities that you just described or are gifted, so to speak, uh, tend to make better coaches. Would you agree with that? I think they do. Yeah. And, you know, the, the old expression, and I love my quotes is, you know, what is it? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, you know, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yep. So I had to be more the harder worker because I didn't have, you know, the, the natural talent like like you alluded to. But yeah, I think that's what has made me personally a, a good coach and a, a coach that continues to, to evolve as well. So I, yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think that's true. You know, the answer to pretty much every fitness question is always, it depends. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it depends on so many things. What makes a good coach or, you know, what makes a successful career in, in anything that we do. But I, I think. I think there's a lot of validity in what you just said. Yeah. How did you come about becoming an instructor as far as did, was there a certain point where you realized, I love this teaching thing. Like I want to be up in front of other coaches teaching them. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing is, and I, I should have said this before is I used to be deathly afraid of public speaking. Now oh. this is from someone who, who went in front of 10,000 people in their underwear and jumped around <laughs> a ring. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? With oil all over his body with, in, in underwear and in front of live TV in front of tens of thousands of people. So how did that happen? And it was because I got to play another character. I got to be another person that I was able to come out of my shell. And because I love wrestling so much, I literally got to put on another hat, not be the shy, little, deathly afraid person to speak in front of people. And I got to be somebody else. So then it opened me up and it would give me the experience to be in front of people and be confident and be comfortable in front of people, which is another major victory that I feel I've had in my life is overcoming a major fear. Like when you're able to do that, that just gives you confidence. It, it, you know, it, it makes you happy. You know, there's so many, there's so many positives with once again, here's another one being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, and I made myself so uncomfortable in so many situations. I mean, I was wrestling in, in barns. I was literally wrestling. I was changing next to hay and, and I was, I was, <laughs> and, and it was a barn and there was like animals around me and I was going out and wrestling in front of 30 people. And, you know, and it, after that, it's like, I could go out in front uh, and, and talk in front of and talk in front of everybody. So fast forward to, to the fitness career, I was picking so many brains. And I was, tr- I was up on so many different instructors of what they were doing and taking classes. And one of the things about me was got me a lot of respect with Equinox was I ended up taking every single class at least twice, at least twice. 
Um, every single certification twice, every single course twice, every single class, even the non equinox, um, courses as well, because I knew I wasn't going to get everything in the first shot. It's impossible. What, what does the statistics say that like you absorb maybe like 20 to 30% of a course that you end up taking? So then I just kept taking the same courses over and over again and instructors started to notice not even going out of my way. One of the instructors, his name is Rick Garrigan, and I, I always like to give him credit. He was a, a big time Equinox instructor at, at the time. He goes, Hey, Gio, I would love for you to assist me with, uh, this Viper, uh, training. I think you'd be, I think you'd be really good. And knowing my history. So I, I always make fun of myself and I say, I have a journey from meathead to movement. And I used to lift like a meathead and I used to, you know, do my, do my bodybuilding exercises. And then I transition into movement where I got introduced to Viper. I got introduced to animal flow. Later on, I got introduced to FRC and, and things of this sort and all this movement. And then just recently stick mobility. And I got introduced to all these really functional type of tools where I fell in love with them because selfishly it made me feel better because I was just a tight, broken bodybuilder. Like how many tight, broken bodybuilders or just tight, broken individuals there are out there. Right. So all these, all these, uh, pieces of equipment and tools made me, uh, made me feel better. And knowing that story, he thought that that story would make it my presentation that much more impactful because maybe I can end up changing some other meatheads to, to movement approach. And then from there, I was in my element and I, you know, I'm in front of people. I get to, you know, as a instructor, as you guys know, you need a little bit of entertainment. Right. You need, you need a, you need a little bit of pizzazz to try to hold them and keep them. So I try to find that fine line between, you know, giving them, you know, uh, a, a couple jokes here and there, keeping things light, but then still giving them the good stuff, giving them the hard stuff. This is what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Why is it important to me? And those are always the three questions that I always try to answer whenever I present. And if I feel like I can answer those three questions, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And why is this important? Then. You're walking out of here knowing the whys. If you know the whys, then you know how to apply them and you know how to practically apply them, whether that's knowing how to use Viper or just knowing how to use Institute of Motion method methodology or, or, you know, a flexibility workshop that I teach or, or anything like that. And then I really started to enjoy the presentations. And then I was like, this is freaking awesome. I would love to keep doing this. And just as paying my dues, you know, as I've learned along the way, I just started randomly emailing companies and saying, Hey, I would love to write a blog for you. I would love to shadow one of your sessions. I would love to introduce myself to you and pick your brain. I would love to interview you and things like that. Because I'm just always trying to be better than I was yesterday. I'm always trying to mm -hmm. create another relationship. I'm always trying to further a current relationship. I'm always trying to learn something, uh, you know, every single day, and, you know, and that's how I've looked at it. And that's how my my uh, public speaking has continued to, uh, you know, snowball. Unfortunately, the, the past year, you know, was, was tough for was tough for public speakers. Um, but you know, I was able to transition. I've actually done quite a bit of uh, virtual training. I never knew how to use Zoom. I, I had to do a Zoom tutorial. Like I didn't even know like how to share my screen. Like share my sweat screen. Share my screen. Oh no, wait, like that. Like I, you know. And then you know, you, you pick stuff up, and then you know you get comfortable with being uncomfortable and you make the pivot. So now I'm fortunate that I make a good chunk of my my living and my career out of something that I was deathly afraid of. I used to make up excuses. I used to bring a bag of tissues and cough drops to middle school and high school on the day I had a presentation. And I used to... <clears throat> Wait, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know if I, that's bad acting, by the way. I ho hopefully I'm a better actor than that. But, you know, it, it was like anything to get out of public speaking. And now I'm a public speaker. Like it's still very ironic. It's, it is interesting that when you overcome stuff that as a kid that you never thought you would be able to overcome. Yeah. And like I said, and like you just alluded, once you overcome something, man, it just, it just gives you that confidence. And then it just makes you want to overcome more stuff. Because then the next thing you fear doesn't seem so fearful because you're like, mm -hmm. wait, I just did that. If I did that, I could do yep. this. And then if I could do All this, right. I could do that. And then it's, well, man, I'm never going to be able to be as good a public speaker as so-and-so, or I'm never going to be able to teach a certification like so. Or um, I said to myself so many times, man, I'm never going to be good enough to work for Institute of Motion. They're, they're just so smart. They're just the, the level of intelligence that they bring and the, their thoughtfulness. Will I ever be good enough for that? 
And then I'm like, wait, you, you can if you work your, your butt off. So just work really mm-hmm. hard and keep jumping down the rabbit holes and, and keep learning everything you can. And then, you know, the, the good things will come. You put, you put in your time. And, you know, an, another person from a quote that I love is Bill Belichick, whether you love him or you hate him. But if, what, he always says, trust the process. You do your job. You do your job. Special teams do your job. Defense do your job. Offense do your job. And if we all do our job together, then, then we're going to have a really good team. So if you think about that in just terms of yourself, right? Just think about, I'm going to trust the process. I'm going to make sure I focus on my strengths and accentuate my strengths. I'm going to work on my weaknesses. And then I'm going to reach out to people that can help me get further along. So that's how I've kind of, you know, looked at the evolution of, of what I'm doing and what I continue to do. I still feel like I'm a baby in the fitness industry. I feel like I'm a baby in public speaking. I feel like, uh, you know, I'm still, you know, kicking myself, be like, Oh man, why did I say that in that presentation? I could have said that better. Or why? Oh, I forgot this and, and this and that. And, you know, th- that's part of being a really good, you know, success is being critical of yourself and saying, okay, what can I, what can I do better next time? How can I, how can I do this better? Hey, hey, Dennis, would you mind looking at the presentation, you know, and just kind of pick it apart and just tell me what you liked, what you didn't like, things like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, never, never stop trying to, trying to be better. And another one is going to be the, the podcast of quotes, but how you do anything is how you do everything. And I try to look at things through that lens, right? How I do anything is how I do everything. And when I'm interacting with somebody or when I'm meeting with college students at FAU or Sacred Heart, and I tell them that. And when I, I had a lot of managerial positions in the past where I would get resumes and I would get emails, people asking for jobs, people asking for even favors or things like that. And the email is not well written and there's no, there's bad punctuation. And there's no, you're probably saying, oh, really, you're talking about punctuation. I said, how you do anything is how you do everything, right? Mm-hmm. If how you send an email, right? It tells me a lot about how much time you take for other things, right? Because if, if mm-hmm. you don't take the time to write g- a good sentence to me, why should I, why should I take you, you know, seriously? Or why should I give you my time? Or why should I give up my time for you? So, you know, that's something that's, that I've evolved to along the way, but I don't like to waste my time. I don't like to waste anybody else's time mm-hmm. either, especially now. And I'm sure Neil, you can, you can agree when you become a father, you know. Oh, yeah, man. You, you know, you don't want to waste a single second because you want to be the best yeah. father you can be. And then you still want to be, you know, have the best career you can. And you want to have that balance. And, you know, pe- people ask me and Dennis, we're, we're going to, I'm going to mention something. We're going to get into it for a couple minutes. You know, people ask me, uh, <laughs> oh, did you, did you watch uh, Game of Thrones uh, last yesterday or whatever? I was like, no, like I, I, I don't have time to watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Like, I'd rather play with my daughter or I'd rather listen to a podcast. Now, with that being said, there is one show, Dennis, that I make an exception to, and that is Cobra Kai. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, now, depending on when this airs, I, I will probably have seen it once this podcast airs, but I have not seen it yet. And I need to know, have you guys seen it? And what do you think of it? No spoilers, though. Oh, yeah, I finished it. I love the writing on the show. There's different factors. It's the nostalgia. I think the show is well written still to bring in that the impact that it had when we were our age. Yeah. In the 80s, it still has that little bit of cheese ball, cheese ball factor, but it still has some great underlying messages to it. I think the acting is for, for what it is, is on point. I thought this season was really well done. Uh, I really enjoyed the last episode a lot. I, I could see the buildup of where it was going. I think what I like, what I've been seeing more of in different things, not just Cobra Kai, but I think what's interesting is everyone has their own story, right? Good antagonist or protagonist, everyone has their own story. And I think it started with Wicked when they told the other side of the story. And that was like, oh, Never thought about what she went through. Why did she become who she became? Is she really that person? And so I think we're, we're starting to see more of that in character development in fictional characters that we've, that we've loved over the years. Once again, they do it for this, especially for Crease. You don't know anything about him. You don't know who he is, what he's experienced. So I think you're really going to enjoy this series this season. I think it was fantastic. 
So that's my, that's my one vice, you know, I'll, I'll watch, you know, I'll watch some Cobra Kai, but you know, other than that, you know, I, I like watching sports, you know, a little baseball, a little football here and there. Um, but other than that, I'm not wasting, uh, you know, I'm not wasting a second of, of my day and, and, you know, of, of my time. And, you know, I, I know Neil can, can agree with me on that. Oh yeah, man. You gotta be efficient. Well, if you have another, if you have another kid, then it's a, it's another game changer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, every, every minute is precious. Yeah. And well, it's funny when you talked about going on a hike the other day. Oh yeah. So Dennis, <laughs> Dennis called me and we just finished our hike and he's trying to FaceTime me and I answered, but you know, the, the, the reception wasn't great. I was like, oh yeah, we found this new place. We went hiking for about, you know, a good hour and 10 minutes, but we only made it about a mile and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my, my son, he's five months old. He started, he started crying. We had to get out some, get out some milk. And then my daughter's like, oh, I want to go in the hiking pack. No, I don't want to go in the hiking pack. No, I want to go run. I want to do this. And I mean, just to get in the car and go somewhere, you know, me, me and my wife would be like, oh my God, we started to get ready 40 minutes ago <laughs> and we haven't left yet because, oh, I, I, oh, I want my bag. No, I want these shoes. I don't want these shoes. I know. Oh, let me put this in the bag. You know, and it's like, oh my God, we haven't even left yet. And we've been getting ready for 40 minutes. You know, it, you know, being a father is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. It's the number one priority in my life. And it teaches you so much. <laughs> and, you know, I have a lot of thick Italian blood in me, which is not known for being very patient. So, so the avenue of patience is something that I've been able to explore quite a bit of <laughs> when, you know, it's putting in perspective, just wait, she, she's a little over three years old. Like she doesn't know any better and she's going to get that example, example from you. Yeah. Everything still goes back to the, you know, the time factor for me. Well, what's funny is you said that, uh, you know, you're working on the patients. Well, I'm, I'm probably one of the most chill guys you'll, you'll meet, but my kids will put me on tilt faster than anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and it's interesting now being, being a parent and then having before you're a parent, you hear parents talk about their kids and you hear, you know, I have two older sisters who have kids and you hear everyone talk about their kids, but until you experience it, you don't realize, you know, how much patience you need, but you could feel Neil, you know, the, the, the love that you have in your heart and that you feel when you get a hug or, you know, when you get a smile and, you know, when you get those, all that affection. And once again, I'm, a, I'm an Italian guy, so I wear my heart on my sleeve. So I'm a pretty emotional guy as it is. So when my daughter says, I love you, and like, that melts my heart and that makes my day. And that's really all I need to, to go on. Then, you know, that, that is, that is time well spent. And I'm glad I did that. And I took my daughter to the park instead of, yeah. instead of saying, Hey, just watch, watch something on there. Just, you know, leave me alone for a couple, uh, you know, a couple hours and just put on, uh, you know, she likes patrol yeah um, and we haven't seen that yet <laughs> uh, she likes paw patrol when, when, she, when she's good i'll you know put on some paw patrol for her every now and then i think what's funny is you said like italians with lack of patience except in the kitchen bro yeah i mean that's one thing like italians get in the kitchen and man the the skill that's needed but the time that's spent is, so that's the one area where I love my Italian friends that always say, ah, oh, we just, so we're not good on patience. I'm like, yeah, you are in the kitchen though. That's the one area. I, I think that's very telling though. Right. Because maybe we all have once again, our own kind of strengths and, mm -hmm. you know, faults, so to speak, where it's, yeah, maybe we're patient in some ways, but we're not very patient in, in other ways. And maybe in the fitness industry, some, uh, you know, some colleagues are, are, are patient when it comes to, you know what? I didn't, I've never thought about it like that. I, you know, I, I think that's a really interesting approach or a really interesting technique, or there'll be some that are be like, no, that, that, that's stupid. And, you know, Neil mentioned, uh, offline right before we got on is, you know, everyone's in these camps, right? You're in the, you're in this camp and, oh, if you're in this camp, then you think that's silly. Or you're in this, if you're, if you're, if you're in this camp, then, you know, you can't think that that's, that's good for you things like that, where it's, you know what, have some patience in our, in your career, have some patience as you continue to evolve, because I'm sure you guys have felt the same way is there are things that in the past, especially coming from a bodybuilding background to now is be like, man, what, what is that guy talking about? That, that's kind of silly. I, I don't know if I believe that, or I'm just going to dismiss that. And then years later, you're like, I think that guy was right. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Or that guy really did know what he was talking about. I just wasn't ready to hear it yet. I just wasn't, yeah. I just wasn't ready to listen yet, which is why I go back to the fact that I love taking courses more than once, twice, even mm -hmm. more than twice, 
because once you once you hear it on a deeper level, you'd be like, now I get it. I didn't get it before, but but now I get it now. So maybe that's a lesson learned that you know maybe we all need some more uh, you know patience you know in with within ourselves and within our careers. So if you think about your training, you know back then you said you're doing mostly bodybuilding, and now you're in into movement mobility. Do you think mm-hmm. that what you're doing now, you know, would have helped on the aesthetics end of of what you needed to look like, you know, for for pro wrestling and putting on the size? Yeah, you know, at the time, and you know, I didn't really have many fitness mentors. So it, I just went in the gym and I just grabbed a barbell and bench press and put a bar on my back and squatted, and no one really taught me, you know, how to lift or you know how to exercise. So you know, the evolution, like I said, from from the meathead to movement was in wrestling is I want to look good in front of the audience. I want to look yeah. good on camera. And to do that, one of the best ways to do that is what? Kind of do bodybuilding. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. that's one of the best ways. That's why uh, you know, bodybuilding shows and physique shows and you know things of that sort, they they work out this traditional kind of body part split because it works. And and that's another thing that like it's okay to admit and it's okay to like just open up about. Um, because now I could easily bash bodybuilding or bodybuilders could easily bash movement, you know, guys are, you know, what, that's not going to make my abs pop out, or that's not going to make, you know, my thighs, you know, get ripped and cut or whatever it is. But there's that, that fine line and balance. I wish as all of us do in hindsight that I was doing 20% of the stuff now, then. And it, it, if I just, if I, if I only knew animal flow back then, if I only knew Viper then. If I only knew stick mobility and, and FRC, you know, back then, then, you know, I would be a lot more resilient. Interesting, uh, you know, thought is Viper is Viper Pro now is based off of loaded movement, right? You're moving your body in multiple directions and planes of motion with submaximal load. Wouldn't that define what a pro wrestler needs, right? <laughs> Even more than mainly any other sport. Right. Because mm-hmm. any, okay, football, my feet are staying on the ground. Maybe I'm jumping uh, for over a tackle or something like that. But pro wrestling, I'm jumping off the top rope. I'm doing mm-hmm. a flip. I'm jumping off the top rope and I'm supposed to catch somebody. I'm doing a flip mm-hmm. outside the ring. I'm, you know, what Michelle calls also odd position strength. I need to be strong mm-hmm. in these odd different positions. What more odd positions can you find than a pro wrestling match where I got one arm up here, my, I'm kind of leaning to one side, one shoulder's higher than the other, one hip's higher than the other, I have more weight on one leg than the other. That's the odd position strength that you need. So lessons that Viper Pro has taught us would be perfect for obviously all ath- athletes and, and performance athletes, but pro wrestlers, stuntmen, things like that, where you know you need to move your body in all these different directions. You need to be strong in a lot of different planes of motion. And okay, if I'm jumping off the top rope and I have to land and jump on one foot, you know, do I have the strength? And what if I have to land and jump on one foot, but I'm I'm kind of turned as I do that, right? So now I'm jumping, I'm turning, I'm on one foot. Like, do we do we have the resiliency to do that? So that's why, man, like, if I only had Viper, back, Viper Pro back then, just like, you know, most of us now, especially as we age, as we get more broken, or we try to, you know, heal ourselves or, or heal our clients who tell us the same things is, man, it, um, imagine if I only had this stuff back then. In the same respect, you want to do enough to look good aesthetically. And I think that's also let's let's just say this a, a good diet, you know, good good nutrition. The the expression abs are made in the kitchen, you know, will definitely will definitely help with that. And that's why I love and I fell in love with Michelle's 4Q, which I know he went into uh, deeply in the previous podcast. Was you know what? Okay, let's do a little loaded movement. Let's do a little loaded linear. Let's do some unloaded movement, and let's do some unloaded linear. And then if you could just check off all those boxes, you become a more resilient individual and you'll be able to perform at, at a high level or maintain performance at a higher level for longer than you would have and or for longer than maybe mostly, you know, other, other individuals as well. So that's why, and that's, and that's another reason why, like I said, I fell in love with the 4Q model because it makes so much sense and it doesn't. And to Michelle's credit, it doesn't dismiss anything. It's saying, Hey, yeah. you like to, you like to do bodybuilding. Yeah. That's one, that's 25%. That's one quadrant. So you know what you should do after you do some bodybuilding stuff? Why don't you just go in that other quadrant? Cause that's probably going to complement what's in that quadrant. And you know what you should do? Oh, you don't do a lot of these two quadrants. So guess what we should be doing more of? 
what we're not doing a lot of. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and then it just puts things in, in simple perspective. And once again, it just, it just makes you, it makes you better. And in, in the end, it's also improving quality of life. You know, I, I currently reside in, in South Florida in, uh, you know, I do most of my work in Boca Raton or Delray Beach. If anybody's familiar with that, any listeners, there's a lot of retirees down there. I work with a lot of the elderly population, 55 and older, uh, 65. I have a ton of clients in their 70s, a couple of clients in their 80s. So I hear the same stories and I hear the same complaints. And back in the day, everybody was somebody. Back in the day, everybody was an athlete. Back in the day, I used to do this. I used to do this. I used to go hiking. I used to be a tennis player. I used to run a lot. And now I don't run because my knees hurt. I don't play tennis because I hurt my elbow. You know, I don't, I don't go hiking anymore because I don't have the aerobic capacity for it, you know, things like that. So hearing these stories from, you know, these older individuals, which I try to learn from as well. Like you're my client, but I'm learning from you. You're going to learn from me. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you some things that may be good for you. And then I'm just going to listen to you. Like I almost like interview them as, as I'm coaching them because I, I get to, I get to learn something from them. And, you know, it just makes the session that much better. You're just having a good conversation, a good, a good rapport. So listening to all of these stories has made me focus even more so on saying, you know what? I don't want to be that 75 year old guy that can't tie his shoes. Yeah. I, I've had so many clients that I first met that literally can't tie their shoes and can't bend down mm-hmm. to touch their toes. And then it's part of my job and our job and the fitness community's job is to help put Humpty Dumpty's back together again and to help this mm-hmm. person touch their toes. And as something as simple as someone's face lighting up saying, Gio, you're never going to believe it. I tied my own shoes for the first time which sounds in a way very elementary and very silly, but that is so powerful that you are able to help improve someone's quality of life. So I always have all of these in, in my mind when I'm training myself because I'm, I'm training not just for Geo right now. I'm training Geo 30 years from now. I'm training Geo 20 years from now. I'm training my clients, you know, even, even, even if they're in their, in their eighties, I'm saying I'm training you to a hundred. I'm training you to get to 100. I'm training you so you don't have to live in an assisted living home. I'm training you. The joke is to get a little dirty is the joke is so you can wipe your own butt. Right. And, and no yep. one, and no one has to do that for you. That's what, that's one of the reasons why I'm training you the way I, the way I train you. And I'm not going to just put you on a bunch of machines and, and hold your hand and, t- and take you on a ride because I need you to make sure you're getting, get, going to get in and out of your car. I need to make sure you can put on your shoes. I need to make sure. When, when your kids come over that, that you can play with them or you can go to the supermarket and buy your grandchild that gift that you want to buy them, things like that. So my uncle is in a walker. My mother has had a hip replacement. She's probably going to go for another hip replacement. She's had a knee replacement. You know, my family doesn't have exactly a great orthopedic history. My dad is in his eighties. He's a gardener, Italian gardener, right? He has his own. He's very proud of his tomatoes and uh, <laughs> he makes his own wine. You talk about old school, oh. old school. My dad is old school. Old school Italian, but he's able to keep himself moving, you know, throughout, throughout the day, just with his day to day, you know, activities. But on the whole, I look at uh, my family too, orthopedically, and I want to be better. I want to help them. You know, I bought my mother just a simple, a simple slant board, a simple calf board, right? Because what does she have the fear of? Falling, right? What, what's one of the first things that happens uh, before you fall? You shuffle your feet. So if you don't have good dorsiflexion in your feet, if you don't have good proprioception in your feet, then you're going to shuffle your feet and you're going to fall over your feet and you're going to fall. So I'm trying to think of the biggest ways that I, I can have an effect on my family and, and you know on my clients. And, and that's how I also look at, look at my programming and my training is, which I feel like we, sh- we should all like look at like, what are the biggest rocks? Right. And I think we all do this, all, all a real, a good fitness professional or a thoughtful fitness professional. You know, what are the biggest rocks? And then once we take that rock out of the creek, the water is going to flow a lot more smoothly. So mm-hmm. maybe just getting my, my mother a slant board and maybe getting her, uh, and I also got my mom and dad a percussion gun just to, you know, get some, you know, blood flow circulation and, and, and maybe just help some, some pain relief as well. Maybe that's what I can give to them right now because I don't live near uh near them unfortunately which is a sad state of affairs as it is but that's why i I got them some things that you know i thought that would help them and that's what i try to do with with my clients so i never thought that i'd be you know going from pro wrestler on tv 
you know, being called with, you know, I'm sure it's going to come up anyway, or someone's going to find out, you know, Romeo, right. Going from, mm -hmm. going from Romeo to training a 75 year old and, and up clients. But you know, that's, that's the roads that we take, you know, and, and I've always been open to opportunity. I've always said, you know what, let's, let's jump down this rabbit hole and, and see where it goes. And the thing is about life is, oh, if you don't like it, then you get, get out of the hole and you go, go jump down another hole, open another door or close that door. Or if a door closes on you, then try to find another door. I really enjoy, sometimes it's frustrating, but I really enjoy training kind of the 55 and older. Yeah, I tend to gravitate. Well, we both yeah, tend to gravitate too. to that because I know personally for me, it's, it's, uh, I understand the life changing aspects, the impacts that we can have because at 20 years of age, you just don't give a shit. I mean, really tell a 20 year older to try to think about being 50 and the long-term ramifications of everything that they're doing when and how's that going to impact you when you're 50 it's going to go in one ear and right out the other for most of them and that's why i really respect those 20 something year olds that i see doing all the right things right now be like oh my god you don't have no idea how well you are setting yourself up for your 40s 50s and beyond because mm -hmm. None of us, I use us just generally, you know, none of us were being that thoughtful or using those techniques when we were that age. Um, and you're doing that now, your joints are going to be so much happier <laughs> with you. Mm -hmm. You know, your body's going to be so much happier that you're doing this stuff now because now guess what? You're going to be able to do those box jumps when you're 40 and you're not going to be able to say, I can't even jump rope when I'm 40 because I can't, I have no power and I can't, I can't leave my feet. You know, little side note, and I have to give her credit is during this whole pandemic, I hired a stick mobility coach. Her name is oh. Laura Gallagher, and I have to give okay, yeah. I have to give her a shout out. And uh, I saw her doing a bunch of great stuff with stick mobility. And once again, let's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And as we can all attest, when we exercise, as hard as we try to help ourselves, we're going to do what we like to do, and we're going to yeah. do, and we're going to do what we want to do. Right. Yep. And that's why we, we need a coach sometimes to give us what we don't want to do and what we don't like to do. And in addition, I knew she was really good with the sticks. So I said, Hey, let's, uh, let, let's get some sessions in and let, let's do some stick mobility. And I only met her because I was actually her instructor for a Viper Pro certification and, a, oh. and an institute of motion nice. workshop. Right. And that goes back to me just being open minded, like, oh, I was the instructor. How can I, how can I learn from the student? We can all learn from everybody. Right. And I was like, mm -hmm. Laura, I see you're awesome with the sticks. Let's, let's set up some virtual sessions. And we've had some great sessions. And she's actually now currently training my wife because now it's like, you got to train my wife. Now, you, you know, you, and she's in her twenties. Like she's the prime example of she's doing all really great stuff now. That's going to carry over to a, being a great coach, being, mm -hmm. uh, but also being a great mover and not being a cranky, uh, 50 year old, uh, woman <laughs> that, that, that's, that says, I used to do this. I used to be this. I used to run. I, I used to, I love playing tennis, but now I can't do that anymore, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because she's doing all that, all that stuff now. So I love to see. I love to see kids like that nowadays, which is weird for me to say kids these days. Like I'm a, yeah. like I'm an old guy, but I guess, you know, once you become a father, once you own a home and once you become 40, then, <laughs> then I can, I can use the, the expression, you know, kids, kids these days. And you know, another thing, speaking of, you know, home ownership is, you know, we just bought our home about three years ago. This was the first own home we ever owned. I had no idea what I was in for. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't. I don't know if you guys are homeowners or apartments or rent or, but man, like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot mm -hmm. of work, especially in South Florida, where you got hurricanes, you got rain, you got no rain, you got bugs, you got you know all this stuff that you know I didn't realize um, until you know I once again now uh, became became a homeowner. But I looked at that as hey, it's another cool challenge. It's another cool you know avenue that you know, to explore that I didn't know that, I, that I learned about. And now I have a deeper appreciation for people who own homes. Just like when you become a dad, you have a deeper appreciation for other parents. And I have had a much deeper appreciation for my parents and I've always respected them and loved them, appreciated them. 
But even more so now that I've become a father, I've made it a point to be like, man, I- I'm sorry when I put you through that. <laughs> like, <laughs> man, like, because now my daughter's probably going to put me through that. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and things, and, and things of that sort. So we've heard that life begins at 40 sometimes. And I feel like at, at this point, like my, my eyes have really been open to a lot of things that I wasn't even ready for or I didn't want. And now I'm embracing. There were a lot of aspects of being a homeowner that you didn't think about. And for business owners and people that want to go into business or own their own gym, there's going to be a ton of aspects that you haven't thought about. So the same thing there on that scale. And you guys had a good conversation, I believe. Didn't you have a really great conversation about business ownership with Emily Spickle? Yeah. 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 And we talked about a lot of that. I remember. See, I'm a loyal, loyal stick mobility Ah, podcaster. And that was a while ago. So I remembered that. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, it's the, it's the same thing. You don't, you don't realize a lot of, about opening up a business. And, you know, I have my own LLC. I have my own little, little business. I don't have a facility. I don't have a piece of equipment. I don't have a tool. Um, but it's the same thing. You don't, you don't realize all the little things, the, the water faucet or the sink and this and that. And then, oh, the, the, the taxes on your business or this or LLC. Do I do an S corp? Am I, <laughs> should I open up a I, IRA? You know, all, all the, all these other things that you don't, you don't think about because, oh, I'm gung ho. I'm going to, I'm going to build my brand. One, one thing I'll, I'll tell, especially the college students is, you know, before you start to really build your brand, you know, make sure you have a good foundation and experience and good mentors to get you to make your brand successful because it's easier than now than to, you know, put some really cool uh, videos up on Instagram and, you know, show your, show your booty or, you know, take off your shirt and, you know, get a bunch of followers. But there's a lot more to building a a brand, a reputable brand, a professional brand, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, this is coming from somebody who spent a large part of his twenties and thirties without a shirt on. Right. And I never wanted to be that trainer. And I don't want to be that type of trainer that says, okay, well, let me take my shirt off. Let me do some animal flow. And, uh, hopefully I, I get a bunch of, I get a bunch of likes and I build my brand that way. I, I wanted to build my brand and I wanted to build my, my career just being good at what I do. And, and being a good good coach and a good trainer, so I think that's a great point when you say, uh, you know, a lot of business owners don't know what they're in for until they're until they're until they're in it. I'm sure you guys, you know, you said that because you you could probably attest to it yourselves. With oh yeah, I, d- I didn't realize this 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 and this was going to happen to me when I when I started stick mobility, right? Well, it's, it's, it still happens. It still happens, <laughs> yeah. you know? It's, it, well, you know, I didn't know there were international treaties for copyrights. I didn't know there were international treaties for trademarks. You're like, I had no idea. Like, you just find this stuff out. There's so much information out there that we're just not exposed to. And when you go into an endeavor like owning a home or starting a business, there's a lot of rocks that need to be turned over. Because there's a lot of stuff underneath. Yeah, and in and, and a way, I think I think that's all good for us. That's why it's good mm-hmm. to it's good to explore stuff, experience stuff. You know, it makes you sharper. It, it keeps you sharp. It it keeps you, you know, it keeps you active. It keeps you, you know, it keeps your vitality up. Whether that's opening up a business, owning a home, or or or, or anything else. Just once again, that being, you know, being okay with. You know, being uncomfortable is where the growth is where the growth really happens is where our evolutions, uh, you know, really, really happen. As hard as it is, you know, I still look back at some of the stuff that, that I did or that I said in, in wrestling and, and in fitness at the time, I thought that was the right thing to do. Or at the mm-hmm. time, I thought that was the, the best thing to do. And I'm a big Eric Cressy fan. Mm-hmm. And yeah. one of the things he always says is, is that if you don't look at your programs, from two to three years ago or even earlier and do a big and do a big one of these, then, <laughs> then you didn't grow enough and you didn't learn enough and you didn't evolve enough because you should always be, you should always be evolving. You should always be growing. And at the time, Hey, 10 years ago when I was training clients, that was the best I could have gave you. You know, that that's, that's really all yeah, I had yep. 10 years later. Would I have trained you completely different knowing what I know now? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that's a big part of it. And that's once again, just getting out of the comfort zone, Taking taking a course, taking a course again, maybe taking a course you took five years ago, you know that you thought mm-hmm. I took that five years ago. I, I got I got the acronym next to my name, or I got I got the CEUs for it. Take it again, and you'll be like, mm-hmm. oh my god, I missed so much, or I totally you know 
I totally forgot about that. You know, I, I need to, I need to revisit that. Well, if you took our course in 2016 and you took it now, you'd see that it's, I mean, it's hasn't completely changed, but it's definitely changed. Yeah. I think one of the things I've always said is if I, if I came across a client that I was training, that I trained 21, 20 years ago, I, the first thing I do is I'd apologize. Yep. I'd be like, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but it's just like you said, Giovanni, I mean, it's all, it's the best I could do at the time. It's, it's what I knew. It's the best I could do. But yeah, I think I've always said, that's the one the first thing I do. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> a lot of the stuff we did. <laughs> now we're going to do things differently. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, that's your current skill set at the time. And yeah. And the interesting part too is, is that back then we were still good and our clients loved us and we were good. And yeah. we, you know, and, and, you know, once you have clients that really love you, like, oh, you're the best trainer ever. And you're the, you know, <laughs> we love you and all this stuff. And then once again, it's like, man, like you thought I was a good trainer then I was not <laughs> <laughs> so, like right. be, being, being hard on myself, being hard on ourselves. Like, yeah, maybe in the grand scheme of things, we were, a, you know, a good trainer, but now looking back, you're like, man, I wasn't, I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't good or I, I didn't know what I, what I know now, you know, which is which is always hindsight, but it, that, that's what what's kind of makes it fun. And that's why I really enjoy getting new clients because the new clients, you're like, man, you lucked out. <laughs> 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 right? You lucked out because you didn't have to go through any of the other stuff that, you know, with, with me being eh, bad and then kind of bad and then average and then a little above average and now decent and now okay. You know, you didn't have to go through that. Now you get you get me for where I am. And you're going to get me, you know, going forward. So that's why I love, I love new clients because it's like a fresh start for me as well. Yeah, that's very true. On the acting scene, you got any stuff coming up uh, in the works, or I, I had a couple of virtual auditions. I uh, didn't, didn't book anything. Oh. You know, it's, you know, the industry is 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 suffering there as well right now. And you know, it, it's it's been hit or miss. Like there was one year where I booked like three or four different things, like big one, like. I did a show on Showtime, Fox, HBO, like all in one year. And then for two years, I didn't book anything. But, you know, that one, that's again, my, one of my favorite words is perseverance. And I've kind mm -hmm. of said that word throughout this whole thing without saying that word, right? Is just having the perseverance. You, you want to talk about being knocked down, like try to be an actor. Like uh. the, 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 the percentages of booking an acting job are, are minuscule. It's probably like, you know, just as hard to become a professional athlete or, 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 you know, baseball player, or basketball player, football player. When, when you walk into a room and, you know, of course, let's, let's, let's stereotype me for a second. You know, I'm walking in a room with a bunch of Italian guys. We've got a mob scene or something going on. And then there's 50 Italian guys, you know, better looking than me, more jacked than me and, you know, have more acting experience than me. And you're like, man, but you know what? You give it your best shot. You, you, yeah. you, you take the shot. And, you know, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you never take. Yep. Um, so, you know, you, you take the shot and yeah, some acting roles I ended up booking and I'm glad I went on it because if I just said, yeah, how are they going to pick me over everybody else? Or there's, there's so many other better actors out there. There's so many other better athletes out there that can do the stunt work of those actors and things like that. But to answer your question, uh, uh, right now, no, but you know, you never know. And, a, a lot of a lot of the stuff that I've actually done in the past is still playing, and thank thank goodness for you know streaming services because I'll still get an uh, an email or a Facebook message or a text message you know on a monthly basis saying hey I just saw you in you know in a in the movie and I was like I did that movie in like 2009 yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know it's still you know thanks to streaming services it uh it, it's helped me you know I did the movie The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had I had a couple scenes in that, and I'm credited uh, in that as well, and that and that's still playing. And you know, to have me a part of that was really full circle for me, right? Because it was, you know, I wanted to be a wrestler. I became a wrestler, mm -hmm. and then I I got a role in the most popular wrestling pro wrestling movie of all time. That was an Oscar nominated movie. <laughs> that was a golden, that was very good. That was a golden, yeah. golden globe winning movie. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you know, there's still a lot of uh, footprints that I've left along the way that, I, that I'm proud of. But, 
you know, it's the good thing about acting is, which is a little different than <laughs> kind of fitness is acting is if I turn 40, there's 40 year old roles. Like I, like, ah, it's, yes. it's like, Oh, it, 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 I don't need the 20 year old roles anymore. Right. And, and if I turn 50, then there's the 50 year old roles that, that still need to be filled up. And then there's still be the 70 year old, you know, older, older Italian guy who still needs to get cast for, for that. So acting is something that I could, that I can do for as long as I like to do. It's, you know, it's, it's a hobby. It's not something that I thought would be full time. And I am as clean cut as you would, you would meet. I've never drank a beer in my life. Uh, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never been high in my life. I've never really partied, never been around drugs. And w- what professions did I go into? I went into pro wrestling. <laughs> and I went into and I went into acting. In in a way, I look at the professions that I've been in, and even fitness to some extent, right? Like the aspects of uh, of the fitness industry could be suspect. So when I look at the big picture of acting and, and pro wrestling and and fitness, is I don't really fit the mold. Like I don't want to go out after the director yells cut, and I don't want to go party. Um, and, and I don't want to, you know, be, be in weird, uncomfortable situations where there's white powder on tables and, and I don't want to touch it or I don't want to do it or I've never been, been around it. And, you know, let, let's face it, you know, we've heard and, uh, we've seen a lot of bad stories and, and bad things that happen to a lot of people in those professions. And I've had a lot of friends and colleagues pass away, especially in the pro wrestling community that have, mm-hmm. that have died, you know, way, way too young, dying in their, dying in their forties. 50s, some in their 30s. Uh, a recent, a recent uh, wrestler just passed away, 41 years old. You know, it's it's a sad event. I'm not saying that these are all from you know bad choices, drugs, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But you know, unfortunately, quite a few of them have been. That was the story of the wrestler, right? That, that was yeah. you know part part of the story of uh, of, of Mickey Work and, and the wrestlers. So in a way, I like to keep acting a really good hobby. That's not going to say, hey, if Blue Blood, if Blue Blood's got a good role for me. <laughs> you know, I'll go on it. And I say that because I've, I've auditioned for Blue Bloods like 10 freaking times. <laughs> and I've been well, like, perseverance. Yeah, perseverance. Keep going. That's right. And I, right? And I, well, I look at it like this. Thomas Edison said the same thing. Every time I don't make it, I'm one step closer to making it, right? Very he true. said the same thing about the light bulb. Every time I found a way that the light bulb didn't work, I'm one step closer to finding a way the light bulb will work. So yeah, if, if I got a really great, great full-time role, I would obviously uh, do it, but it's just kind of fun getting roles, roles here and there. And fitness is, uh, you know, fitness is my, my bread and butter now. How different was it doing a virtual audition versus an in-person? There's gotta be something miss, like, you know what I mean? Like energy wise. Yeah. Yeah. It, there definitely is. And, and that's something that I've never really had to do before either. Like we've done, I've done a lot of self tapes, which is, which is easier because if you don't like it, then you just record over it. Yeah. If you're, if I'm going to the casting director and I'm in that room, you got one, maybe two shots. Maybe he'll say, do it again, but do it and be a little more serious. You got that one shot. <laughs> and then you're, yeah. you're walking out of there saying, was I too serious? Was I not too serious? Was it did, did, when he, when he told me I was too serious, you know, and, and then, and, and that's why actors get in their heads, um, as well, because it's so easy to get into your own head especially when you only got that one shot. When you're doing a self-tape, I ended up... I, I actually don't like doing self-tapes because it takes me too long because I always say, wait, I could do that one better. Wait, wait, wait. Let, uh, let, I could do it better. If I'm walking into a room, if I'm doing it virtually, I only got 45 seconds. I, <laughs> whether, it was yeah. good, whether it was good or not, they're still pressing end call on the, uh, on the Zoom call. But right. yeah, there is... There is a different energy and you try to be truthful, you know, as an actor to get into the acting uh, chops, you, you try to be truthful, you try to look into the camera and you need to know your lines. And if you do those three things, you, you've done all the, all the best you can do. And, you know, in acting and fitness and everything, and I, I've kind of alluded to this as well as as long as I can look back and put my head on a pillow every night and I could say, you know what, I did the best I could. Mm-hmm. As, as long as you can say that. When you rest your head on the pillow every night, I feel like I've had a good day and I have no remorse and I have no regrets. And that's something that I want to look back on my life on and say, you know, I've had, I've had no, no regrets about going after things. You know, I'm, yeah. you know, if, if I told somebody, Hey, you know, I'm going to be on a show with uh, James Franco on HBO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. 
what, whatever. Yeah. And you're going to be a pro wrestler too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> good, good luck with that one. It, it just, it just goes to show you that literally if you put your heart and your mind into doing something, you can do it. Like it may take time. You will get knocked down. You will have to persevere. You will fail. But if you really want to do something, you will do it. I'm, I'm living proof of that. That's awesome. Well, thanks. You, thank you for coming on, man. It was a great conversation. So thank you very much for uh, coming on the show. And uh, I think the listeners will get a lot out of this one. So thank you again, brother. No, thank you guys. I really enjoyed myself. And like I said, I listen, I listen to this uh, every, uh, every week. And you know, interestingly enough, now I'm going to put this in your head. So I try to get a weekly massage every week. So I often okay. li- I often listen to you while I'm getting a massage. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Right? So, <laughs> perfect. So, that's so, actually, that's, that's good. So you guys or are like my, my massage. <laughs> no. Well, that's, that's, that goes back to time, right? Even right? when yeah, I'm getting, could, yeah. even when I'm getting a massage, I don't yeah, want to waste. I, I, I could be getting, yeah. I could be getting better. I could be getting better yeah. getting a massage. I could be learning something off of a podcast. Um, just right? even when I'm, even when I'm lying down. Um, but I, this is, this is, like I said, it's almost like a dream come true because I'm on a podcast of a podcast that I really enjoy <laughs> and that, and that I really look up to and, and admire in a company and, and two guys that I really look up to and admire. So th- this is, uh, this is a really great experience for me. Thank yeah, you, well, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, social media, how do people get in touch with you, follow you, f- keep up to date with what you're doing? Yeah, I try to keep it simple with my full name. So if you just put Giovanni Roselli, dot com giovanni roselli instagram uh giovanni roselli uh on on facebook uh i think i'm official giovanni roselli on uh my facebook business page but yeah i'm not uh i'm not i'm not hard to find and you know that's uh that's one of the reasons why i I like my name because it 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 makes me a little uh unique uh there's growing up there's a lot of a lot of my friends used to call me john which is the english translation of of giovanni but when I got older, I started to go by Giovanni because I, I just, it, it was, it's my birth name. So mm-hmm. go by your birth name. And it just made me a little more, uh, made me a little more unique. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, until up next episode, be good to each other. <laughs>